Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Catholic Themes in Tolkien. Today we're going to continue our discussion of sacramentality, but today we're going to talk about the ring as anti-sacrament. The ring. The ring has awoken. This is the one ring. Don't wear the ring. My own ring. Must have the pressure. Very much like to hold it again. The ring is altogether evil. Why not use this ring? The ring must be destroyed. The ring. The ring. Where is the ring? Ring of power. <laughs> One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, find them. So what's up with the ring? What is it? I used to pose this question to my students in my, my Tolkien class, and I would say, what does it represent? And I got a lot of interesting answers. Some talked about, you know, maybe a sort of a twisted version of technology and the machine. Uh, some, being that it was a Catholic school, talked about maybe somehow it represents sin, it represents temptation, it could represent addiction, it could represent, you know, the dark power of the ego left unchecked. Uh, all those are good. I think uh, part of the brilliance of the ring is that as an evil talisman, it sort of uh, opens itself up to many different conjectures and speculations about what it might represent. And the point is that it is a seen made object which channels unseen dark malevolent powers, the dominating will of Sauron. So the ring is a made physical object, which is a vehicle for dark spiritual power. It's the visible sign of mysterious invisible forces. It's a seen artifact that holds within it great unseen malice. Like some twisted inversion of a Catholic sacrament, it not only signifies, but in some way makes present what it signifies. In this case, not benevolent divine grace, uh, not the power of the Lady of the Wood, uh, not some unseen light from Valinor, but the dark dominating will of Sauron. Uh, not only that, but the ring has a mysterious power or a pressure that it exerts over its wearer slash owner in that it cripples the will and it insinuates itself psychically and spiritually over its owner. It's altogether greater than its mere sum properties as a made physical object. So a little bit of background on the ring. Uh, some of you are, have read The Silmarillion. Um, some of you haven't. Some of you maybe have just seen book. Some of you don't even know what the heck I'm talking about when I mention the Silmarillion. Uh, but we do get a little bit of the lore in, in Lord of the Rings, uh, especially in the Shadow of the Past chapter, chapter two of Fellowship of the Ring, where Gandalf has a long conversation with Frodo. We're going to be quoting from that at length here a little bit later. But Sauron, according to the lore that we learned in the Silmarillion, he had forged the One Ring long before the Lord of the Rings takes place. And that was when his appearance was still fair. So he was a Maiar. So in Tolkien's mythology, there's like Eru, Iluvatar, who's like the god figure. And then there are these figures called Valar. They're sort of like the gods, if you will. They have sort of sub-creational powers under Eru, Iluvatar. And then you've got the Maiar, who are sort of the next tier down. Gandalf is one of them, uh, as is Saruman and the wizards. And so that's basically what Sauron is. He is a fallen Maiar. He was the lieutenant to Melkor. So Melkor is like the ultimate uh, satanic figure, if you will, in, in Tolkien's mythology. So Sauron, Sauron learned uh, from the most evil being in all of Middle-earth. He got chained up uh, after a battle, and, and he's been kind of taken out of the way where he can't do any more mischief. But Sauron uh, learned a lot, including the base art of treachery. So after a certain battle, uh, he ends up getting uh, arrested, taken prisoner by the elves. And he kind of plays like, you know, after a long, long time passes, he sort of plays like he's learned his lesson. He's reformed. His looks are still fair. And he basically wins their confidence, wins their trust, and starts learning the art of, of elvish craft, uh, including the art uh, of the ring making and some of the elvish Art that goes into that, uh, he of course twists to his own designs. So Sauron offered them much knowledge and in exchange acquired a gradual mastery over the elves' creative arts, 
which in turn he used for the forging of his one ring. So the one ring was to be the master ring controlling the others made with it and designed for the manipulation of men and dwarves. There's a nice little vignette about this at the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring. Seven to the Dwarf Lords, great miners and craftsmen of the mountain halls. And nine, nine rings were gifted to the race of men who above all else desire power. Unbeknownst to Sauron, the Elf Lords made three other rings. Although they were not evil and were never used as such, nevertheless their power was inextricably linked and attached to the one master ring of Sauron. Elrond and Galadriel wore these two rings, using them to maintain their sanctuaries of Rivendell and Lothlorien, respectively. The third was given to Gandalf by the great Elvis shipwright and watcher of the Grey Havens, Círdan. So the ring, as a literary device, follows kind of the same sacramental logic that we've seen uh, in the objects that we discussed in the last video. Uh, however, it represents, as we said, the other side of the spiritual and moral coin. So the Lembas bread, the Athelas, the horns of Rohan, they embody and channel benevolent forces. The ring embodies the opposite. It's always ultimately a vehicle of malevolence, regardless of the motives behind its initial use. In the shadow of the past chapter, Chapter 2 of Fellowship of the Ring uh, is where we get a detailed explanation of the ring. It's given through Gandalf's conversation with Frodo. And the ring's unambiguously evil nature is made very clear. Gandalf says, It is so powerful that in the end it would utterly overcome anyone of mortal race who possessed it. It would possess him. It grants to its wearer not life or growth, but mere continuance, until at last every moment is a weariness. It has an unwholesome power that sets to work on its keeper at once. The ring looks after itself, and in the end, utterly devoured Gollum. So terrible is the ring that even Gandalf does not trust himself with it. And he vehemently refuses it when Frodo offers it to him. Elrond wants no part of it. Galadriel rejects it. There's no good use for the ring. Uh, basically, only one real choice remains if you find yourself possessing the ring. Either lose it or lose yourself. From a Catholic perspective, Tolkien's fictional treatment of the ring kind of treads on difficult philosophical and doctrinal grounds, but it simultaneously shows his originality and creativity as a writer. So the traditional Catholic view of evil is that it's a no thing, it's a privation, it's an absence. God is creator and he pronounces good all that he creates according to the creation account of Genesis. The serpent tempts Adam and Eve to misuse God's good creation and their own freedom by choosing that which was forbidden. The serpent is no equal to God. He is God's creature. The serpent makes nothing himself, but he manipulates people through deception and using God's good creation in perverse and in disordered ways. So evil derives from a choice in the will. It's of ethical and not metaphysical origin. So this is a very, very important point from the standpoint of Catholic philosophy and theology. Uh, there's a heresy called Gnosticism, an ancient heresy which seems to rear its head in almost every generation under different forms. Part of the Gnostic heresy involved a dualistic worldview which uh, vigorously asserted that the intellectual and the spiritual realm, the soul if you will, was good, and the material was bad. The Manichaeans were dualists and this was the philosophy that St. Augustine had fallen into uh, prior to his conversion. You can read a lot about his uh, wrestling with this Manichaean Gnostic dualist philosophy as he talks about his path to his conversion in his famous book, The Confessions. So it was, Gnosticism was considered among the first heresies uh, and it was labeled as such and it was vigorously opposed by many of the influential early church fathers and pretty much every doctrinal pronouncement of the church since. Even Pope Francis in his document on holiness uh, talks about the ancient heresy of Gnosticism and how that rears its ugly head today. From this perspective of, of the Gnostic dualism, in real life, there can be no such thing as an anti-sacrament. So, strictly speaking, you know, objects in reality, they can be grossly misused and perverted, but in as much as they exist, in as much as they share in being, in as much as they have reality, they maintain some core fundamental goodness, however distorted. So, there might be an object that's, you know, intentionally set apart for evil use, like, uh, 
like a Nazi concentration camp. Uh, there might be a object that is maybe a diabolical curse or a hex is put on it. But as far as the ring is a one-sided vehicle for darkness and evil, a corresponding example in reality does not readily come to mind. So the cool thing about fiction is you have this ambiguity that you can work with. Again, we said in the previous video that literature deals in ambiguities and life is filled with ambiguities. Uh, so there's some creative freedom to develop and explore issues that would not be possible, say, in an essay or in a work of theology. So Tolkien uses the medium of fairy story to really explore in a very intriguing way this idea of what I'm going to call an anti-sacrament. So sometimes, you know, in fiction, you can create things that don't really exist, but just because they're not real doesn't mean they're not true. So, for instance, we've never known uh, the ideal just king uh, like Aragorn. Um, there's been some good kings. Of course, Jesus is the king of kings. We'll leave him aside because he's also divine. He's the savior of the world. But, you know, so when we think about Aragorn, the cynic might say, well, there's no such thing as Aragorn. Come on, the guy is just too good. Earthly kings aren't that good. Well, that's true. But as a sort of an archetypal figure, even though he might not be real, he's true. Even though we've never really maybe visited a idyllic, uh, sort of you know self-sustaining agrarian place like the Shire, you know a delightful place where people you know garden their own food, where they eat six meals a day, and there's very little crime, and they live off the land, and they're comfortable with their little hobbit holes. Uh, and the greatest delight in their life is, is smoking pipe weed and enjoying a good fireworks display. Uh, well, we probably have never seen a place exactly like that. So in that regard, the Shire is not real, but it's true. Uh, anybody who enters Middle Earth uh, can kind of feel the sense that like, yes, there's something profoundly true here. And even though there might not be an actual Shire, in real life. Uh, there's something that our heart recognizes profoundly true. So I would argue that the ring plays a similar role. Uh, while no rings of power exist in real life, there are resemblances enough to render it a convincingly resonant symbol. So I'm going to turn to Tom Shippey again. You've heard me quote him a lot. I call him the Gandalf of Tolkien scholars. He discusses the issue of the ring with great insight. He first describes the three assertions about the ring which Gandalf makes, which are so utterly essential that, quote, the whole point of the story collapses if they are not accepted. And so these are as follows. Number one, the ring is immensely powerful in any hands. Number two, the ring turns everything to evil, including its wearer. No one can be trusted to use it. There are no right hands and all good purposes will turn bad if reached through the ring. This is something that Faramir recognized and Boromir did not, as we heard in the speech of Faramir that we quoted at length in the Unlooked For Friend section. And number three, the ring cannot simply be left unused, set aside, etc. It has to be destroyed, and this at its place of origin, the fires of Mount Doom. These assertions determine the story, says Shippey. In effect, they set up the background for the narrative to unfold as the mythological anti-quest. So Shippey then points out that while cynical critics have managed to find fault with just about everything in The Lord of the Rings, he says, no one, to my knowledge, has ever quibbled with what Gandalf says about the ring. It is far too plausible and too recognizable. It would not have been so before the many bitter experiences of the 20th century. So he speaks of the ambiguity of the ring amidst his insightful discussion concerning the themes of evil as absence and evil as presence. And so this is where we get to the kind of thorny philosophical and uh, theological ground as far as from the Catholic perspective. Because again, for Catholics, evil is absence, it's not presence. But with the ring, there is an element of both. There's definitely evil as absence, but there's also evil as presence. So Shippey likens the ring to addiction and refers to it as a psychic amplifier, which would be evil as absence, which feeds off the inevitable subjective flaws and faults of its owner. Yet he acknowledges that if such were merely the case, uh, then it might only need to be set aside and not entirely destroyed. Conversely, if its evil were merely external and objective, which would be evil as presence, then wise characters like Gandalf or Galadriel, for example, 
uh, could take it to be destroyed, and, and they would only have enemies to contend with, not themselves. So perhaps Shippy puts it best when he says, One can never tell for sure in the Lord of the Rings whether the danger of the ring comes from inside and is sinful, or from outside and is merely hostile. And one has to say that this is one of the work's greatest strengths. So again, fiction, like life, deals in ambiguities, and as such, it's an especially effective artistic tool, as it can evoke and uncover subtle truths in a way that doctrine alone never could. Flannery O'Connor, you heard me talk about before, she's another one of my favorites. She once famously said that Christian dogma is about the only thing left in the world that surely guards and respects mystery. It's a striking statement, and one to which she seems to have rigorously adhered as a believer, yet her work can hardly be reduced to Christian dogma. Dogma informed her art, but it did not dictate it. And like Tolkien, she expertly maintained a, a consistent uh, interplay artistic truth and doctrinal truth while somehow managing to be faithful to each. In our own postmodern age of great uncertainty, where relativism and moralism strangely coexist, and you've got this you know, continuously transmitted images of you know, global evils transmitted 24-7 on the internet and on, on news media. Tolkien's anti-sacrament of the ring resonates as a symbol wherever it stands with regard to real-world criteria of philosophical consistency and doctrinal accuracy. Uh, poet W.H. Auden, a fellow Christian friend and admirer of Tolkien's work, he runs, once wrote, Tolkien a letter, and he was talking about the orcs. And he said, you know, what's up with the orcs? You seem to have created an entire race of wicked beings that are, seem to be evil in and of themselves. Again, it's evil as presence versus evil as absence. And so he said, is this heretical to Catholic teaching? Tolkien gave a very wise and insightful response. He confessed that he lacked the theological proficiency to make such a judgment. But then he added, I don't feel under any obligation to make my story fit with formalized Christian theology, though I actually intended it to be consonant with Christian thought and belief. So consonant, but not formalized. Uh, this may perhaps be the best way to situate the distinctively modern ring against traditional theological Catholic categories. So... Again, the ring is this fascinating object. Uh, Shippy talks about how we recognize it. Uh, we know that, he says, you know, the whole story would fall apart if the central conceit of the ring were not plausible. But it is plausible. In fact, it's highly recognizable. And nobody, in spite of the criticisms that many have leveled against the Lord of the Rings, nobody's ever quibbled with the plot being sort of the anti-quest to get rid of this thing that you have to either lose it or you lose yourself. So as an anti-sacrament, the ring has perhaps never been better described than by Catholic critic Stratford Caldecott. And I'm going to quote him at some length here because it's such an insightful description. He says this, The ring is a symbol of pride and power. It represents everything that draws us into the kingdom of the dark lord by tempting us to become like him. Its circular shape is that of the will closed in upon itself. Its empty center suggests the void into which we thrust ourselves by using the ring. The invisibility with which it cloaks the wearer at the same time severs our normal relationships with those around us. We all have such a ring. It forms the foundations of our own dark tower, namely the ego, the false self. Our quest, like Frodo's and Sam's, is to renounce the ring and be rid of the hold that it has over us, ultimately on the road that only Christ has traveled fully to the end. Well said, Dr. Caldecott. Thank you. Couldn't have said it better myself, so I think I'll give you the last word with regard to the ring. So with regards to our discussion of sacramentality, of which this is the third installment and final installment before we move on to some other things, I just want to wrap it up with a few closing comments. You know, in a cultural climate today of materialism, of positivism, uh, where reality is often reduced to what is visible and what is measurable, Tolkien's sacramentality is an artful departure from the norm. Thoughtful and open readers recognize the Middle Earth, a world in which some sort of faith seems to be everywhere without a visible source, like light from an invisible lamp. 
amid the increasingly closed world of materialism, secularism, a curiosity awakens when this light coming from an invisible lamp can somehow be seen illuminating the narrative. Uh, it's provocative. It might open up some new horizons and it might maybe raise some questions. You know, if there's light from an invisible lamp, well, what is that invisible lamp? Does it exist? Where is it coming from? And we've talked at great length about how I'm arguing that it's Tolkien's Catholic faith, Tolkien's belief in Jesus Christ, uh, Tol Tolkien's transcendent vision of the world, uh, and this sacramental worldview whereby the material is the vehicle for the immaterial. So on the flip side, in a contemporary religious climate that veers more and more towards the spiritual and not religious, uh, forms of religion seem more and more to be discarded, leaving the spiritual nowhere to land. Getting back to Tolkien's wine bottle metaphor that we talked about in the first of this series, uh, Tolkien said that the church is kind of like the dusty old wine bottle. Uh, it, might, it might leave a lot to be desired based on its physical appearance, but for those who can draw old corks, there's still some good wine of gladness in that old bottle. Uh, but today we're living, I think, more and more in a world where people want to just discard the bottle because it does look old, it does look shabby, and it's kind of hard to believe that something uh, so ignoble in appearance could be housing uh, the wine of gladness. And few anymore seem to really want to even take the trouble to draw the old cork. So if, if the mystery, so to speak, if, if, if the divine or the spiritual or the invisible, whatever you want to call it, if it has nowhere to land, well, then it just kind of takes back off. It goes back into the ether. It goes back into the transcendent heavenly realm and we never really encounter it if it can't be mediated somehow by the physical world. Uh, once the bottle's gone, what holds the wine? It would seem in our day, the self and uh, subjective religious experience. But in the end, this gets reduced to sentiment and feeling and it ends with a religion with no point of contact. Reality no longer matters because the divine has forsaken it. There's only the self, or perhaps to put it more critically, the ego. Uh, so for Tolkien, as for anyone with a sacramental mindset, reality matters. Reality includes visible and invisible dimensions, and some mediating form usually needs to serve as a bridge between the two. In fact, some would argue, the Catholic world would argue that man is the bridge. You know, man is material and he's spiritual. We find ourselves kind of trapped between heaven and earth with no chance for escape. Uh, but thankfully, we believe in a God who entered into the fray, a God who took flesh so that we could see what God is like and who implemented certain forms, whether the divine word of Scripture or the sacramental forms uh, like the Eucharist and like baptism, etc. So there's some mediating form that is the bridge between the spiritual and the material. Middle Earth is a sub-created reality presented as a part of a greater reality. Its seen elements contain and mediate unseen elements. In Tolkien's hands, hobbits become heroes. A scruffy ranger becomes a king. Grains become lembas. Threads become elven cloaks. Horns become a summons to destiny. A neglected weed restores health to the dying. For the Catholic, the invisible arrives through the visible. The unseen arrives through the seen. Grace arrives through nature. Spirit arrives through matter. Mystery will always need a history and the wine will always need a bottle. Blending of art and faith, Tolkien gave us both, one through the other. So that wraps up our sacramentality discussion. I hope this has been a little bit insightful for you. I hope at least you've enjoyed uh, the plentiful references to Tolkien's letters and his literature. Coming up next, we're gonna be talking about friendship. Now, we've talked about the unlooked-for friend as the sort of the person who, who breaks into the story at just the right moment. But now we're going to talk about the, the depths of true friendship, uh, particularly Samwise Gamgee. Uh, so coming up, we're going to do a deep dive into Samwise Gamgee, particularly through the context of friendship. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.